Um, great. Thanks for attending. Uh, I know, afternoon session, after you eat, and keynotes and stuff. So, um, cool. So, I'll be talking about ML-based uh, cyber threat detection for produc production systems. I'm George Williams from GSI Technology. Uh, my agenda is the following. Um, we're going to start talking about the cybersecurity landscape. Uh, I'll spend some time unpacking these buzzwords uh, in, in the title of my talk. Um, we'll get into why my company is interested in this space. Uh, some light architecture, uh, and then we'll finish it up with some code. So, uh, a cybersecurity landscape. And here are a few of uh, the tech headlines from the past year. Um, from uh, state-sponsored bad actors hacking into core U.S. infrastructure, vulnerable IoT devices being coaxed into mining cryptocurrency, um, hackers uh, disrupting Apple's uh, main chip supply chain from TSMC, and the various uh, apps and websites that have been hacked and lots of user data stolen. So we've been living under the, uh, the threat of these hacks and uh, attacks and breaches for so long, one wonders if we're making any progress at all. Uh, yes, that is Mike Myers uh, as Dr. Evil weighing in on, on cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, sharks with lasers notwithstanding, it seems to be getting worse. Uh, every half a minute, there is a hack attempt at a Fortune 500 company. The least sophisticated of attacks, denial of service, it's still a problem, and it's on the rise. And the cost of a data breach has reached unprecedented levels. So, you know, amidst the chaos, there are opportunities, as there always are. Uh, cybersecurity vendors, a lot of them are seeing record profits and a lot of interest in their product. If you have a good idea uh, in cybersecurity, a novel idea, um, it's a great time to get some funding. And the shortfall, the predicted shortfall of three million cybersecurity workers by the end of 2020 is likely a boon for tech workers looking to make a move. In fact, in the last few years, some of the hottest tech jobs have been some kind of security DevOps engineer and cybersecurity companies um, are hiring data engineers and data scientists like crazy. And that's good uh, because we're gonna need this deep level of expertise, especially around these data-driven methods like machine learning in order to craft the cybersecurity solutions we need now, definitely in the future. Um, and so let's, let's go ahead and unpack uh, this Venn diagram. Uh, no data talk is complete without a Venn diagram. Here's mine, just one, I promise. So at the intersection of machine learning and cybersecurity, this is perhaps the most controversial. So let's start with that one. So like other industries, uh, cybersecurity is really excited about um, adopting AI um, or any of these data-driven techniques that fall under the umbrella of AI. Data science, big data, machine learning, what have you. Um, especially to deal with uh, this predicted shortfall of cybersecurity workers through automation. On the flip side, there is a lot of skepticism about AI, um, especially in cybersecurity where it's not clearly well-defined how we might be creating riskier systems uh, that rapidly adopt some of, these, um, uh, some of these methods. And this is, in fact, a conversation happening beyond cybersecurity and other industries, um, right? The, the machine learning and the AI hype, where are we with this? There are a lot of cautionary tales that we're gonna start to hear about with this AI-first approach for a lot of these companies. So what are, what are the, uh, where does the skepticism come from? Um, here, here are just a few of the things, right? There's, there's AI washing where a company has decided that all of a sudden what it has been doing for a while is AI and it rebrands it as AI um, when in fact it's not really doing anything like that. If machine learning is involved, uh, we still have issues because uh, if you look under the hood of a lot of these machine learning models, especially uh, deep learning, 
it's a big bucket of floating point numbers and doesn't lend itself to interpretability or transparency. Um, and so, right, this is an issue of AI trust that um, is, is a, a very important topic within the AI community right now. Um, along those lines, uh, you know, a lot of the training data that is collected for these models, um, it inherently exhibits bias. And the model um, that trains on bias data um, will itself exhibit that bias as well. And so that's another issue, um, lending itself to a lack of trust in these systems. And at worst, uh, adversarial attacks. These are attacks that are specifically targeted um, to these systems that take advantage of um, uh, brittle aspects of machine learning that aren't well understood. Uh, an example from computer vision, um, right? You have a very common computer vision model um, that is trained to recognize objects. You see there on the left, it has uh, correctly predicted um, that the, there's a panda in the image, um, but the attack here is to add, is to perturb the image with additive noise in just the right way, um, where um, per, uh, perceptually, right, we still see a panda, but the machine learning model has now predicted that uh, it's a gibbon with a high degree of confidence. And so these kinds of attacks are um, very pervasive for all types of, of machine learning right now. So you know, those are the issues with, with AI and these data-driven techniques. You know, what, what I will say, I could spend the whole talk talking about these issues. Um, with respect to cybersecurity, I think we just need to treat these things as just another tool um, in our toolbox to craft cybersecurity solutions uh, and not a silver bullet. Um, for this problem. And you would be surprised at how many companies out there uh, are pushing the message that AI will solve problems, all the problems for cybersecurity. So that's the most controversial unpacking. Uh, the rest of it will be pretty straightforward uh, and a lot uh, less controversial. So with respect to cybersecurity and production systems, um, you know, most of the systems we're talking about in, in the cloud, right, they're running Intel hardware, uh, with some form of the Linux operating system, which is uh, very useful to unify common technology stack um, across, across these machines, across cloud architectures and infrastructures. But it also means that we have a whole lot of machines, uh, a whole lot of infrastructure that are vulnerable to the same kinds of attacks. And uh, there at the bottom, I'm showing the iconography around some of the um, uh, more known ones over the past few years. Uh, heart, heart bleed, shell shock, image tragic, uh, dirty cow, specter, meltdown. You've probably perhaps heard of some of these vulnerabilities or these attacks. And so these are very, very rich targets for, for bad actors. I think a very recent one is um, uh, dirty socks, actually, which attacks uh, container orchestra orchestration systems like Kubernetes. Uh, and I spared you the, uh, the icon uh, for that one. So they're, they're, th these are very, like I said, very, very active and, and rich targets for attackers. So at the intersection of machine learning and production systems, um, right, if we look under the hood of, of that, that common technology stack, Intel and Linux, right, it's gonna look a lot like this. It's composed of a lot of these subcomponents. Um, we have the application layer at the top, right? That's where your, your databases, your SQL, no SQL, um, all of your open source stack, your, your Apache web servers, all the applications you're familiar with live there. But they're built on top of these, these fundamental components, right? These system libraries. Um, and then we're talking about the, the system call interface to the operating system. And everything underneath that is, are the subcomponents of the operating system itself file system there over on the left, to the networking uh, layer uh, in the middle, um, the network stack, to the core internals of the operating system itself, scheduler, virtual memory manager, all the way down to device drivers and even the hardware uh, itself. And so if we're looking at data-driven techniques to sort of speak to an active threat uh, that's taking advantage of a vulnerability in any one of these components, we need to look for the data sources that can speak to that. Fortunately, over the last 10 or 15 years, those data sources have, have matured quite a bit. 
Um, uh, there, over on the left, we have the capability to inject um, actual probes into user space programs in, into the kernel, uh, various types of tracing um, through system calls, um, uh, all the way down to being able to look at specific um, telemetry from the file system, the, uh, uh, the network stack, um, device drivers, and even, even down to um, uh, performance counters that aggregate various types of statistics in the hardware itself. Those are the PMCs all the way over to the right. Um, and so there, there is, there is a, a variety of data sources we can tap into, right, to, to think about monitoring threats that are happening um, in, this, in this common stack. So putting it all together, uh, we have the opportunity and we have the motive in order to create these uh, cyber threat uh, uh, solutions. Um, and, of course, we're all here because there's now the means to scale that out with, with a lot of the technologies we're talking about, Kafka and Apache Spark um, in particular. So before I get too much um, uh, into some of the architecture and code, let's take a, a brief time out for why my company is interested in this. So GSI technology, we actually create chips. Um, there, there is the chip there on, on the left. We've been creating uh, computer memory for about 20 years. This is the kind of memory that you might find in high performance routers uh, on the backbone of the internet. Uh, we make radiation hardened memory for satellites um, and for upcoming space tourism. And just recently we started working on a computational memory chip. So it accelerates certain kinds of search uh, and AI uh, workloads. And so uh, we're putting these chips into these boards and we're creating these super clusters um, uh, out, of our, out of our chip. And so, um, uh, right, one of these systems has a lot of our uh, chips, um, right? These are standard PCI boards. These chips are going into, plugged into uh, I standard Intel motherboards with uh, Linux OS running on it. Um, and for a lot of our partners and customers, we're providing um, uh, basically a, a managed hosting um, service. Some of our customers want to buy these and put them on-prem, but a lot of them are okay with us hosting it. So essentially, we are, we are a production system. Um, uh, and so our customers are uh, in biopharma, performing computational drug discovery, um, and also in government aerospace, um, a lot of them are running simulations uh, based on, um, based on our, our chip. And so uh, a lot of these guys are, are, are running um, you know, workloads with highly sensitive data or in some cases top secret projects. And what's interesting is when we told them about these clusters, right, they're like, okay, that's cool. How, how are you going to um, you know, defend against some production attacks that we know about? And so. Um, that has prompted us to look at cybersecurity vendors, and we are um, tapping into some vendors. Um, but for some other things, for some very specific attacks that have been cited, um, we had to go and, and start to craft um, our own. And so that's, that's why we're pursuing this, this agenda that I'm talking about here. So, you know, some of you, uh, you know, not deeply embedded in cybersecurity might be thinking that, hey, you know, why don't you just get a really good uh, firewall? And your intuition is right. You know, uh, defense starts at the network, uh, at the perimeter. Um, but as we know, um, attackers still manage to, to get through. Um, and one thing that a lot of attackers will try to do, right, they'll try to implant malware or viruses into your file system. And so, Having really good, robust malware virus detection is, is the next level of defense. Um, but attackers still manage, manage to get through um, that defense. And so really your, your last line of defense is to actively monitor what's happening in these hosts. So just to, just to summarize, right? Really good perimeter protection, very important, not enough. Really good um, t detection, protection in your file system, uh, uh, really important, but not enough. And your host is still vulnerable to a broad range of attacks. Um, uh, 
you know, and the simplest ones are, right, credential theft through social engineering. Um, session hijacking is still an issue with a lot of uh, applications where an attacker is able to get a hold of an authenticated session token. Um, but also there are insider threats. Um, you can still have highly privileged users that are able to access the system that are already in the system uh, becoming bad actors. For example, um, all of a sudden being disgruntled and, and looking in areas of the file system they shouldn't and, and trying to upload those files um, outside of the system. So active monitoring is, is very key for um, a lot of these cases. Um, actually, it's, it's actually important for some, some of our government aerospace customers. So when we're, when we're thinking about very specific um, uh, kinds of attacks, here are just a few of the use cases um, that have been brought up as, as concerns. Um, and, and some of these you've probably heard of if you've been in cybersecurity for a while. Uh, recently, right, um, it's been shown that there are fundamental vulnerabilities in uh, Intel hardware where you can leak um, highly privileged data through the hardware. Um, uh, through the cache, for example, as a side channel of information. Um, and this was made apparent through the, uh, the Spectre and, and Meltdown um, cybersecurity vulnerabilities you've probably heard of in the last uh, couple of years. Um, control flow attacks, you know, this is, this is where um, a bad actor has managed to manipulate the normal um, flow of process, uh, of execution of code um, to their own advantage on a machine. ROP was an example of this a few years ago, return-oriented programming. Um, since then, there have been a lot of mitigations that have been put in place um, to, to stem this kind of attack, such as uh, data execution protection and randomization of code that gets loaded into memory. Um, that handles a lot of cases, but the, the last chapter of control flow attacks has, has not yet been written. This is still um, a vulnerability um, that is uh, uh, still present in, in the, the te technology stack that I'm talking about. And of course, we have the anomalous uh, user behavior, right? We have the, the insider who is able to uh, get access to the system all of a sudden becoming a bad actor, exfiltrating files and, and data. So when we're talking about using a data-driven technique like machine learning in order to craft um, some kind of cyber threat uh, detection for these things, what are the data points that we're talking about? So for here, um, right, we could be talking about uh, monitoring very low-level um, uh, data, uh, aggregate data, in the CPU itself. Um, and a lot of these are made available through performance counters. Um, for control flow attacks, um, we might be thinking about actually um, sampling the call stack um, to understand if something anomalous, like a control flow attack, is actively occurring. And for anomalous user behavior in the file system, um, we're interested in measuring um, very, low, uh, very low level file system events. Um, what files, what directories, what areas of the file system are being accessed, uh, read, write, privileges, um, and, and also time series uh, features. Like when, when is this user accessing this area of the file system and why are they doing that all of a sudden now on a Friday night, for example? They don't usually do that. So when we're talking about uh, machine learning um, to accomplish any of these things, um, we're gonna be talking about the two broad classes of of uh, machine learning models, supervised and, and unsupervised. And so for, for uh, those of you new to this, um, it's very simple uh, at, at the highest level, right? In, in the supervised case there on the left, we're collecting a bunch of data for training and we're also labeling that data, right? So in a cyber threat context, right, we might have the ability to say, hey, that data point represents something bad, the red X, and that data point represents something normal, those, those blue arrows. And we have a myriad of techniques in which to 
uh, form a mathematical model that helps us um, uh, separate the two types of training data, and that, and that becomes the, the machine learning model. Here I'm, I'm depicting just what, a, uh, what possibly a, a support vector machine might do. Um, of course, it's pretty easy to see how you separate the bad and the good with, uh, with a line or a hyperplane, but in general, um, you have a lot of features, not just two, um, but, but you know, uh, in some cases, tens and into the hundreds. In the unsupervised case, right, we're not actually labeling the data. What we're doing is we're collecting enough data in order to form uh, a sense of baseline and normal activity, and then we are applying some kind of pattern matching. So here, the pattern is clustering, um, and uh, once, we, right, once we record enough baseline, we apply the patterns, right? Our model in this, in this case it are the cluster centers and their radii. Um, and so, right, you have a deployed model, new data points come in. If they fit into a cluster, right, you might decide that that's normal activity. If they don't, then that might be the indication of something that is uh, anomalous, and you might want to notify your security team um, to that event. So that, at a high level, right, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, these two broad classes of machine learning models in order to um, think about crafting um, a cyber, th cyber threat detection strategy with machine learning. And, you know, the clustering I talk about there, you know, that's just one form of unsupervised learning, right, that boundary separation technique on, on the left there, you know, that's, that's one form. There, there are many techniques available to us in order to craft these, these models. Um, all right, so let's get uh, into, right, a data pipeline, and it's pretty straightforward um, at a high level, right? We have, we have these rich data sources that can speak to a, an active threat or an anomaly um, that's occurring in any of these uh, core components of this technology stack. Um, we're selecting, uh, selecting a few of those for a particular kind of uh, attack we might be worried about, right? Cache side channel, control flow, anomalous user behavior, what have you. Um, and pushing that data into um, a Kafka cluster, an, in, an ingestion technology um, that can handle that kind of data. Uh, and then from there, pulling, pulling the data we need in order to either accommodate training, uh, recording a baseline for anomaly detection, um, or uh, we're, we're collecting the, the data on the production systems in order to perform inference on those models, to do the anom anomaly or not, or it's a threat um, or not. And so at a high level, it's, it's a fairly simple data pipeline um, uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. Let's get into just a few more uh, details here. So w when, I, when we talk about the, the raw data source, um, uh, you know, there, there was that there was that picture on the left with a variety of these data sources that evol have evolved in Linux uh, uh, and Intel over, over the time. Um, each one has, has developed on its own. Um, and so what's nice is that very recently there are uh, utilities um, and capabilities that are in some of the latest Linux kernels, for example, um, that actually can um, collect a lot of these data, data sources in, in one unified uh, interface. So uh, PERF for collecting hardware statistics, and eBPF, which is extended Berkeley packet filter, um, pretty much does the rest. Um, and uh, eBPF is very cool. You actually create very simple, uh, non-Turing complete programs that get compiled into um, uh, a a virtual machine that, that runs in kernel space. Um, uh, and, and you can program these very simple machines in order to do packet filtering, monitoring for system calls, all, all the things, pretty much all the things you see there on the left. So extended Berkeley packet filter, very cool functionality uh, now in all the lit, late, <coughs> excuse me, uh, li latest Linux kernels. And e to make it even easier, uh, there is a Python interface even to that. Um, and so that's the IOVisor BCC library um, uh, project. And so uh, super easy uh, capability in which to get to all of these, these very rich data sources that can, that can speak to a vulnerability or an ongoing attack. Uh, 
Um, right, so we have, we have perf, we have uh, eBPF, um, we're crafting um, programs in which to capture the data sources we're interested in. We're pushing this data um, into, into a Kafka cluster. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of you know about the benefits of Kafka and this kind of scalable ingestion stream. Um, you know, for, for the stuff, for the things I'm talking about here, um, right, if you have a deployed model um, and you are getting uh, some of this telemetry from a Kafka cluster, right, you can treat that data as pretty much a real-time data source. Kafka won't get in your way, right, if, if you need that, that data right now for, for inference. But at the same time, right, you can take advantage of its ability to retain data, and that's very useful for, for a couple of use cases where you might be doing online kind of machine learning where you are learning on a window of data over time, um, and also for uh, doing online baselining for, for anomaly detection. Um, and so that retention capability is, is highly advantageous. Um, but, right, it also accommodates um, the real time that, that you will need for doing uh, inferencing. So uh, on the training and inferencing side, uh, what can you say that is, hasn't been said about Apache Spark at this conference? It has a tremendous uh, number of capabilities, and it's gr it seems to be growing um, uh, constantly. Uh, very sophisticated ways of doing both supervised and unsupervised learning, both in batch and continuous uh, uh, streaming um, uh, modes. Um, and that's right, that's useful for the types of, of ML um, that we're talking about, and some of the really new capabilities where um, it's load balanced via uh, Kubernetes, via container orchestration, um, just to make it, make it easier and even more scalable. So let's go ahead and um, uh, go into a, a scenario here where I get to show some code. Uh, and let's talk about training for uh, a very simple cache side channel. Um, and so we're gonna think about crafting a, a side channel um, a model um, with data. And so here's a scenario. We, we have our, our, our rack of, of, our, of our chips and the Intel and, and Linux technology stack, and we're pushing data uh, into, pushing telemetry data that can speak to this attack into a, a Kafka cluster. And so, right, very specifically, we're, we're looking at the data sources that are there on that rightmost column, the performance memory counters, um, and a, a little bit more detail about that. The, you know, the hardware maintains certain statistics um, on all sorts of things, right? The, the number of instructions that it's, that it's performing, the rate, um, uh, the number of cache misses, uh, cache loads, various uh, statistics about the cache, uh, branch, branch prediction, branch, um, number of branches, all, all these things that can speak to, in an aggregate way, um, what, the, what, the, uh, what the chip is doing at any one point in time. And originally, the intention of these performance counters was really to help uh, a lot of low-level compiler writers to be able to optimize the code that they were writing um, uh, right on top of the hardware. Um, it turns out that these are, these are very useful for, for other means as well, such as in, in cybersecurity. So uh, when we're talking about uh, th those, that telemetry um, with respect to the CPU and Intel, we're talking about three different types of now, now we're sort of uh, 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 treating uh, different nodes differently. So, uh, so you know, here we're isolating one of the compute nodes uh, in order to capture normal statistics. So we're gonna run workloads on these machines and we're gonna make sure they're quarant that it's quarantined such that um, none of the attacks can actually occur on the system. So this is our baseline system. We're, co we're collecting normal activity um, uh, from, from regular workloads. 
The other system is where we're actually attacking the system with, with a known variant of the attack, a POC, they call it, a proof of concept. And so for a lot of the uh, attacks that you, that you hear about, that you've seen, right, someone out there, a cybersecurity researcher, has written some code that will, that will actually uh, demonstrate how it works. These are proof of concepts. And so for uh, Spectre Meltdown, there are uh, a myriad of proof of concepts where someone has actually shown, this is how you use this to leak certain amount of data. Um, here you go, here's the code, here's a POC. And so this system right now, this system is collecting telemetry uh, around an actual attack um, through one of these POC variants. So, um, of course, I'm leading to this is that, right, those two arrows on the top, they're, we're collecting data for a supervised learning model, right? We have normal activity, we have uh, now abnormal activity. We're pushing that uh, into um, the, in the way we're doing that. The, that data gets pushed into two separate topics uh, in Kafka. And then, right, we have the other production nodes of the system that are running workloads on behalf of partners and customers, um, uh, you know, pushing the same telemetry data, but that data is then going to be used uh, uh, in an inference uh, manner um, with, our, with our machine learning models trained on the data at the, at the two arrows on, on the top. So, uh, right, same data points, same features, uh, different machines uh, creating different, uh, uh, under different kinds of workloads um, in order to produce training data and in order to produce inference data. That's all going to separate topics um, in our cluster. So, uh, yes, that's right, training data and, and inference data. All right, so let's get to some code. And you know, I'm just gonna show you sort of the, the salient parts of um, you know, one way to accomplish, li accomplish this um, from, our, from our prototyping. So here, here is this very simple uh, code. It's Python. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm partial to, to Python. Sorry, all you Java developers, uh, Scala developers. Um, but here, uh, all I'm doing is, right, th this is, this is a, a very simple way in which to collect uh, those um, performance counters. Um, there, there are hundreds of these counters. Uh, we just chose a few of these here based on experimentation, the ones that could speak to training a model. And you'll see that there in the, uh, in the command equals, right? So we're just running this perf command to collect those stats, LLC loads, last line cache load misses, uh, last line code prefetches, cycles and instructions. So th th these are the specific features, uh, as it were, um, uh, that we're collecting around the performance counters. Um, we're collecting it at 10 millisecond intervals. Um, that's what that dash I 10 is. Um, and uh, we're collecting it globally. So we're basically, we're using Python to invoke this, this command here. And that's what that, com that's what that line afterwards is, that popen. Just like run this command and capture data as, it, um, as it's being reported. There, there's, a, there's an open source project I will refer you, you guys later to if you're interested in this, in, this, um, in any of this stuff. Uh, and also, as you saw before that, there is, uh, we're connecting to a Kafka producer, um, and we're going to be serializing JSON objects um, uh, to, to Kafka. And that, that while loop there, um, I know, it's a while true. Um, you should call me out on that. Uh, but basically, it's just sitting there, it's capturing data from this command, right? All of these, all of these statistics, these performance counters, um, uh, and then uh, converting that to basically uh, a, a Python dictionary, a JSON objects. And that's what you see there below the convert to dictionary call in that while loop is essentially what it looks like, right? We have a label. Uh, in this case, we are collecting normal activity. So we're gonna call it zero. Um, and then the features, right, are going to be um, numbers that speak to each of those performance counters that, that we're capturing. And then for simplicity here, I just have um, five of them shown. 
uh, and then just pushing that to Kafka. And that's it. That's the, this, this particular code or you know, some more robust variant of this is running on, on each node, collecting that data. Um, so now let's take a look at uh, right, the trading. So this is now, now we're going into the Apache Spark world. Again, it's, it's Python. Um, and you're seeing this, the salient parts of um, uh, what Spark is doing in order to do this continuous training. Um, here you'll notice that I'm using Spark streaming and I'm doing this uh, as, as micro batches, I believe it's called. Um, and it's pretty straightforward here, uh, right? Creating a stream. Here we're combining, because we're doing training, we're, we care about uh, two topics, the baseline topic and the, uh, the POC topic, right? That's, our, that's our, uh, our labels of zero and our labels of one in order to, to train this model. And then um, we are uh, converting that stream into uh, a payload. We're producing that labeled, uh, that streaming labeled data set there. Um, uh, and, then the, and then the training that's happening in an online way. Here, here I'm just showing uh, a linear regression uh, model here um, with some very uh, simple hyperparameters. Um, and then training on that stream. And so, right, this is a, this is a micro batch um, scenario. So this is getting invoked um, on a regular basis in order to do continuous, um, a continuous training. So on the inference side, right, in, interleaved with this, is also the inference code. Um, and what you see there is um, uh, uh, two different concepts, right? Here, we're opening up a, uh, a connection to Kafka in order to send our alerts um, uh, for something downstream that wants to respond to it. Um, uh, and there is a callback here um, which is important to understand this RDD callback. So it's going to get invoked for every uh, RDD in, in the data set that we'll produce later on. And what you'll notice is, is that it's checking to see if um, the uh, predicted value is above some threshold in this model, you know, some, some configurable threshold. And if it is above this threshold, it's gonna say, hey, you know what? This, this is weird, this is close to something that is abnormal, so I'm going to, to alert you. Uh, and the rest of the code there is similar to what we saw before, right? It's opening a connection to the stream. In this case, we're interested in the production nodes that are reporting telemetry, uh, not the two topics that we're providing training data, because this is now inferencing with our model. Um, and the predictions, actually, now we're calling uh, the model's predict on function um, with that telemetry. The predictions, um, we're applying the callback to all of those predictions. The predictions are just now uh, between values of zero, zero and one. Um, and so that's it, right? The, you know, the, the more robust versions of these codes are much longer. I'm just showing you the, the salient parts of how you can accomplish um, this kind of continual training with this kind of data. Um, and it's pretty simple. Um, collecting the data with existing tools that are available on Linux systems to using Kafka and Spark for continual training um, and, and inference. So, uh, right, um, in order to right, make these uh, systems more robust, there are a lot more, more questions, right? We, we're worried about model validation, right? Uh, and we care about false positives and false negatives, right? And what are the hyperparameters to, to make sure we keep those low? Um, for a continuous and automated learning, right? Uh, you know, is that the right thing? Is that the right thing to do? Where is the human um, involved in this loop? Um, adversarial attacks, like I said before, there are lots of areas right now, uh, even in the models I show, where they're open to adversarial attacks. Um, persistence uh, and forensics, we might want to persist models um, in a way in, in our HDFS, in our file system, or we might want to persist some of that te telemetry even longer. I show Spark streaming, but structured streaming is the rage, and I think a lot of this is even easier then and there's an impact to networking and local inference. Um, and final slide, 
uh, we're having our chip cluster available in Q4, which means we need to have a lot of these protections in place for some of our partners. Um, and we're open sourcing all of the stuff we're doing here. Just search for the Honeycomb Security Project. Um, and so that we'll be checking a lot of code in over the next few months. Um, and we have a very active blog on Medium. And please reach out to me on Twitter for any uh, further questions. And I think I am uh, over time by 30 seconds. So see me uh, outside if you have any, any questions. Thank you. Yep. Please give him a big hand.